guys welcome back i hope everyone has had a blessed and a beautiful week girls i love you and i miss you more and more every day today i want to take some time and i want to talk to you about a topic that normally we don't really give much thought or consideration to and that would be the topic of the lord's prayer now when we hear that term the lord's prayer our mind automatically wants to jump to Matthew chapter 6 because within Matthew chapter 6 that is where we find what we perceive to be the Lord's Prayer. But before we can really get into this discussion we have to recognize and understand some things. When it pertains to words words don't just have meaning they also have power. Power that is given unto them through you, through me, through this world. And we have to be careful because words are very important and very powerful. They can uh, cause us to feel emotions. We can feel happy and joyful, or we can feel sad and depressed. Uh, words have the ability and the power to allow us to gain uh, knowledge and wisdom, but it can also cause doubt and confusion. So as you can see, words are very important and they're very powerful. We have to be careful about uh, the words we choose and how we use them and where we place them. In Matthew chapter 6, as it regards the Lord's Prayer, it begins in verse 9. But I'd like to start uh, a little further back than that because there's a theme that goes on here and I want to show it to you so that hopefully it'll help you to better understand uh, the point that I'm trying to get across to you here. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, Use not vain repetitions as the heathens do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Okay, did you catch it? Did you see it? There's a, there's a pattern going on here. All of those thou's and ye's. Thou and ye, that's you and me, okay? That's who and what it's talking about here. All right, now let's begin this, what we perceive to be the Lord's Prayer in verse 9. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Pray who? Pray me, pray you, pray us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, now Luke also refers uh, to the scriptures in which we just read in chapter 11. Uh, it's pretty much the same thing. The, the only significant difference is, is that in Luke, it does not uh, refer to the last part of verse 13 in chapter 6, where it says, 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, now, to help you try to understand this a little bit better and, and, and maybe uh, have the ability to see more clearly where I'm going with this, I want to share a story with you. Uh, where I'm currently living, when I first moved in, there was nobody here but me. And so I was pretty much by myself. I kept to myself. I didn't bother nobody. And, you know, what friends I have, if they wanted to come over, they would call and say, hey, you mind if I come over? And I'm like, no, sure. Go ahead. Come on. Well, I'm sitting here. I'm minding my own business by myself. And the phone hadn't rang. I'm not aware of anybody coming over, but, you know, it was like day after day, week after week, uh, you know, I'd be sitting here and I'd hear knock at the door. And I'm like, what in the world? Who is that? Who's here? And so I'd go and I'd open the door. And, you know, it varied. Uh, sometimes it was a man. Sometimes it was a woman. On a couple of different occasions, it was a police officer. But it generally kind of went in the same direction as far as conversations go. And they would be like, hey, how you doing? And I'm like, good, you know, uh, what can I do for you? You know, because before I get too far into this conversation uh, and waste too much of my time with these people, uh, I don't know them. So I want to know who they are and why they're here. And they're like, you know, is so-and-so here? And I'm like, no. Um, I'm not even sure I... I know these people, you know, you're talking about. And so obviously they'd be like, okay, well, you know, I'm sorry. I appreciate it. You have a good day. And they would leave. Well, you know, it started out. It was like all the time. It was nerve wracking. Uh, but as time went on, you know, it became fewer and fewer. Uh, and it got to a point where eventually, you know, it just stopped altogether. When the cops came, you know, on those two occasions, uh, their reason for being here is they was looking for somebody and they had used this as a last address. And they said, are you so-and-so? And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm Reggie. And they're like, you got any ID? So I'm like, sure. So I show them my ID. I give them my social security card. I give them mail that's addressed to me here at this address. I show them a copy of the rental agreement, you know, this I'm proving who I am. This is my house. This is mine. This belongs to me. You know, I pay the bills here. I pay for the power and the water. And as long as I'm paying the rent, uh, this is my house. This belongs to me. This is mine. Nobody else's. It's my house. It's mine. Okay. Do you see where I'm going here? Do you, do you, do you see uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to lead you and guide you towards? Well, Let's look at, at Mark chapter 1. And I want to look at verse 35. Okay. And in Mark chapter 1 verse 35 it says, And in the morning rising up a great while before day, he, who's he, Jesus, went out and departed into a solitary place. In other words, he wants him a long time. He was by himself. Nobody was there but Jesus. Okay? And there prayed. Who prayed? Jesus prayed. Why? Because he's by himself. Nobody else was there. It wasn't me. It wasn't you. It wasn't the disciples. It wasn't the people. If he happened to be, you know, in proximity to a, to a town or a city, it was Jesus. Jesus prayed. Okay? Now, look with me at Luke chapter 5, and I want to read verse 16. It says, and he, who's he? Jesus, withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Who prayed? Jesus prayed. Okay, one page over. In chapter 6, I want to look at verse 12. And it says, and it came to pass in those days that he, who's he? Jesus, went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Who prayed? Jesus prayed all night long to God. Nobody else, just Jesus. Okay, let's look at um, Luke 
chapter 22. And I want to look at, uh, well, I want to start in verse 41. And it says, And he, who's he? Jesus, was withdrawn from them. Who's them? The disciples. About a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed. Who prayed? Jesus prayed. Saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, who's in agony? Jesus. He prayed. Who prayed? Jesus prayed. More earnestly and his sweat. Who sweat? The sweat of Jesus. Was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Okay. So we see here that Jesus is praying. It even goes on into uh, verse 45 it says and when he arose up from prayer and was come unto his disciples he found them sleeping for sorrow so they were asleep they weren't helping him pray he was praying all by himself who was praying jesus was praying okay let's look at verse 20 uh, chapter 23 verse 34 okay here we see jesus he's already been captured he's been a part of that 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 Mockery of a trial. Uh, done been sentenced, and here he's hanging on the cross. Then Jesus said, or then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay, now, when we go back to Matthew, and we look at what we perceive to be the Lord's Prayer, this is where words come into play as being important and powerful and how we should be careful about the words we choose and how we use them and where we place them. When we say that Matthew 6, uh, 9 through 13 is the Lord's Prayer, it is not the Lord's Prayer. It is the Lord's um Model prayer. The Lord's model prayer. It's not the Lord's prayer. It's the Lord's model prayer. Okay? Listen. At this point in time, you have to understand what's going on here. Uh, Jesus and the disciples are on the Mount of Olives, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And he is talking to them and he is teaching them because he knows he knows that his time is short here. So in the process of teaching him, he starts talking to him about prayer. And he's telling him, you know, uh, do not be like the hypocrites and, you know, pray in the streets to be seen by men. Um, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions. Um, be not ye therefore like unto them. Uh, for they think, uh, that they shall be heard for their much speaking, okay? And so the disciples, they're sitting here and they're listening to what Jesus had to say. And they're like, well, you know, uh, I'm like a lot of other people. I'm not really that comfortable, you know, praying, uh, especially out loud. And uh, to be honest, I really don't know how to pray or what to pray or how I should pray, you know? And so... Uh, as we see more clearly in, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 1, it says that uh, the disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray uh, just as John taught his disciples to pray. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Okay, let's turn over uh, to Luke chapter 11. And I will go ahead and read it for you. It says, And it came to pass that as he was praying, who was praying? Jesus was praying. In a certain place, at this point in time, the Mount of Olives, someone on the Mount, when he ceased, when he stopped, when he finished his prayer, they heard what he was praying about. And one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he, who is he? Jesus said unto them, when you pray, say, when who prays? When you pray, I pray, we pray. Okay, 
Now, as I said, this is not the Lord's Prayer. This is the Lord's model prayer. Okay? He used this as a teaching tool, as an instrument, as a way of conveying how a prayer should be constructed and offered uh, to the Lord, to, to, to God Almighty. Okay? I'm going to read it to you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something that maybe you've never seen. Okay? Let's start back again in verse 9. It says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Okay? Verses 9 and 10. What he's doing here is kind of uh, a, fr a first fruit type of, of, of situation here. Uh, he's giving God uh, the glory, the honor, the majesty uh, at the very beginning of his prayer. Okay? Now, in verse 11, uh, down to a certain point in verse 13, we enter into what's called uh, the petition of prayer, meaning, you know, why are you praying? What are you praying for? What's the reason? What's the purpose? What are you asking? What are you seeking? What are you needing? Okay. Verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay. This is the petition of the prayer for why the praying of the God, what they're asking, what they're seeking, all right? Now, at this point, it, it leaves and ends the petition of the prayer, and it goes right back to what it did in the very beginning, and it gives glory and honor to God, and it says, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen, Okay? Did you catch it? Did you see it? He started out with, with prayer uh, of glorifying God the Father. And he ended it with glorifying God the Father. The, the, the beginning of uh, this quote-unquote prayer and the end of this prayer. The first scripture and the last scripture. Do you see it? The beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus said, I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I mean, do, do you see it? Did you catch it? This was just a model, a teaching tool, a guideline for them to follow. When you pray, give God honor and glory first. Once you've done that, then you go into the petition of your prayer. Tell him why you're here, what you want, what you desire, what's wrong, what's the problem, what are you going through? Why are you hurting? Why are you so much pain and suffering and sorrow? Okay? Then, once you're done telling him all your heart, then go ahead and finish up your time with the Lord. Finish up this prayer and give, once again, glory and honor unto God. Give him your praise and finish it up the same way you started it. Beginning and the end, the first and the last. Okay? Now, you say to yourself, well, if you say this ain't the Lord's Prayer, then what is the Lord's Prayer? Well, the Lord's Prayer would be a prayer that he prayed. That would be his prayer. He prayed it. Nobody prayed it for him. It's his prayer. Oh, okay. So, so when he says, Father, if it be thy will, you know, let this cup pass from me. So that was the Lord's Prayer. No. Oh, okay, it was when he was on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what to do. No, no, no. Those are prayers that Jesus did pray unto the Father. No doubt. Those are prayers that Jesus did pray. But those are not in any way, shape, or form to be considered the Lord's prayer. Okay, well now I'm just lost. I'm confused. I have no idea what's going on here. Um, you know, if that's not it, then what is the Lord's Prayer? The Lord's Prayer is the entirety 
of John chapter 17. Don't believe it? I'll prove it and I'll show it to you. All right, let's turn to John chapter 7. It's going to take me a minute. I don't, I don't even think I got it marked. Um, okay, there we go. All right, John chapter 17. Listen to this. Verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said. Okay, why did I emphasize that? Because it's where everybody goes wrong. It's where, where preachers uh, become so dumbfounded. It, it, it's where the judgment and, and, and the perceived knowledge and understanding gets clouded. See, in Matthew chapter 6, it says, Pray ye. So uh, those two words there, one being prayer and ye being you, what we should do. That's what confuses them when it comes to what they perceive to be the Lord's Prayer because when you get over here to John chapter 17, not only is it known uh, to uh, be the longest prayer in the Bible that Jesus did pray or anybody prayed, but uh, it is known... Uh, for the very uh, first few words in the first scripture of John 17, where it says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said. He didn't pray. He didn't say it. Uh, you know, it says he said it. He says he spake it. Okay, when you pray, unless you're praying in the spirit, praying uh, from within, uh, you're talking out loud. Uh, you're going to speak it. You're going to say it, right? Okay, it's the same thing. But they're trying to take it to mean something different. In other words, this is how you, you could read the scripture. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and prayed. Said, prayed. Same thing. Exactly the same thing. Ten million percent. But the preachers don't perceive that. But yet they got all the diplomas and all the wisdom and knowledge. And they're supposed to be so smart and they can't even figure that out. It takes a dodo like me. To show you people these things. Okay, now let's go on. F uh, we're going to uh, read verses 1 through 4 to begin with. Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Verses 1 through 4, he's given uh, glory and praise unto God, the Father. This is how he's opening up his prayer, just like Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Okay, now, Beginning in verse 5, he goes into the first of two parts of his petition. The petition part of his prayer, okay? And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I come out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, listen to this, I pray for them. I pray not for this world. So we need to quit praying for this world. We need to start praying for people. Okay? Forget the world. If 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 if, if Jesus Christ himself is not going to pray for the world, why are we? Listen, the world's going to do and act and be the way it is. This is full of sin. All these things shall pass away, but my word shall endure forever. Listen, we need to pray for people. We need to pray for our families, for our sons, our daughters, our, our spouses. We need to pray for our next door neighbors. We need to pray for the people we work with. Forget the world. Uh, what ain't destroyed by man, when the Lord comes back, he'll take care of the rest. 
I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Okay, this is what we talked about in the last video. Uh, this is talking about Judas Iscariot. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and thy word hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth, that thy word is truth. And thou hast sent me into the world, so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Okay? Here at the end of verse 19. He is praying unto God the Father, and he is praying for and on behalf of the disciples here. Okay? But now... He's going into the second half of his petition, of his prayer, and he's going to switch it up, and he's going to start praying for us, for you, for me, for, for those who will receive him, okay? Verse 20. <clears throat> Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Their word meaning the words of the disciples that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which they hast given me, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Okay, this is the end of the second part of the uh, petition portion of his prayer. Now, he's ending his prayer here by going back, just like he did in the beginning, with uh, praise and honor and glory unto God. Verse 25. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Okay, folks, listen. This isn't rocket science. And, you know, I was sitting here uh, to show you some of the weird things I do. Uh, sometimes I'm here at the house and I'll, I'll start preaching to my own self. And, you know, I got to thinking the other day about how I was going to go about presenting uh, this information, this scripture to you. And it was almost as if the Lord tapped me on my shoulder and said, you got a minute? I'm like, yeah, what is it? You know, what have I done now? And he said, uh, you know, why do you tell people they don't have to take your word for it, get in their Bibles and read it for themselves? I said, well, because if they don't believe me, 
then the only thing they can do is to get into the Bible and read it for themselves. And so they'll see it, and they'll see that I'm telling the truth. So, you know, in essence, it gets them into the Bibles. And he's like, well, you know, you just said it yourself. If they don't believe you, then they'll get in the Bibles, they'll see it for themselves, and they'll believe what you're saying. Why are you having to justify the words in which you speak? Because I have to show them that I'm not sitting here just trying to come up with some off-the-wall stuff and, 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 you know, make up stuff. That I'm sitting here, letter for letter, word for word, line upon line, you know, sharing with them the truth of your word. He says, but you shouldn't have to justify yourself. He says, and why would you justify yourself to them? You know, you want to be justified in my presence, right? You know, oh, absolutely. And he says, you don't have to justify yourself. My word backs you up. I fight your battles for you. As long as you are preaching the truth of my word, you have all the host of heaven as well as myself, backing you up. More or greater is the number that is with you than that is with them, meaning the enemy. So as long as you are preaching and teaching the truth of God's word, you shouldn't have to justify yourself. My word will back you up, and my word is truth. And if they don't believe what you're saying, then they're not believing what my word says. And if they're not believing what my word says, they're not believing in me. And they got a bigger problem than you sitting there trying to justify yourself and prove that what you're saying is right. My word is truth. My word doesn't have to be proven. And you don't have to be the one to prove it. I will prove it. So I'm sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, Reggie, you're an idiot. How could you do such a thing? Oh my gosh. I bet every time I've said that to y'all, it's just literally sat there and broke the Lord's heart. So I am forcibly going to try my very best never to say that anymore. You don't have to take my word for it, get into the Bible and read it for yourself. Folks, I know you think I'm crazy but and don't believe me, but listen, everything I've said, the word of God backs me up right here. You've seen it for yourself. You've read it for, you, for yourself. I'm not going to do that anymore because I don't have to justify myself to anyone other than God because it's not the truthfulness or the quote-unquote righteousness uh, that people may see in me. It's what God sees in me is what matters. You know, uh, in John chapter 6, I've shared this with you before, but I, I, I'm, I'm going to share it with you again. Um, give me just one second to flip over here. Um, in John chapter 6, it says, It is uh, written in the prophets, verse 45, It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God, every man therefore that hath heard, and have learned of the Father cometh to me. And above that it says, No man can come to the, me except the Father which hath sent me draw them, and I will raise him up in the last day. So, you know, listen, if you believe me, you believe me. If you don't, you don't. If you think I'm crazy, hey, go for it. But I'm sitting here and I'm teaching you things they won't teach you in church because of religion, because of doctrine, doctrine, theology. Uh, because of vain philosophies of men, because of pridefulness, things that that, that, that that may make you think a little differently than what their uh, religious beliefs or their doctrines uh, prescribe to. Are you a child of the church and of the pastor? Or are you a child of God? Who better teach you the word than the word himself? I'm going with God. God teaches me. God shows me. God, through his spirit, leads me and guides me. I can go listen to a good message and listen to what a preacher has to say. But that don't mean that, that every what he says is truth. But it also don't mean every what he says is false. You can get some good out of it. But for me, 
when when he sits there and, and, and starts going off into left field and starts trying to use scripture to back up what he's saying, and that scripture don't back up anything in what he's saying, and it's just one after another after another, and I'm sitting there, I, I listen, I can't take it. It's, the way God made me when he saved me, I can't deal with that. I'm going to stand up in church, I'm going to interrupt your service, and I'm going to call you out, and I'm going to show you about 10 verses uh, that prove you wrong. And then you say, well, you know, uh, I don't know what to tell you, but, you know, you heard the verses of Scripture I used, and it says I'm right. I'm going to take the very verses that you used, and I'm going to show you that in those verses that you tried to use where you're wrong, and then I'm going to turn around and give you another four or five verses on top of that. So you done got like 20, 25 verses right there, and I've done showed to prove you wrong on that one point. You know, I, listen, listen. If I say I'm going to do something, or if I tell you I'm going to give you something, then you can believe I'm going to do it. I'm not going to stand and pick a fight from a biblical standpoint or start an argument with someone when I don't know if I can uh, fully back up what I feel led to say. If the Bible don't back me up, I'm not going to say it. Okay? If you also look in verse 7... It says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Judge that which is within. Uh, you know, you got to ask yourself, that Reggie, you know, is he saved? Well, yeah, yeah. I believe he's saved. Do you think Reggie loves the Lord? Yeah. I mean, the way he talks, and as much as he talks, and as long as he talks, yeah. Yeah, I have to say, he loves the Lord. Uh, he, he He's completely sold out to God. I, I believe that with all my heart. So you believe I'm saved. You believe I love the Lord. Uh, do you believe I want to go to heaven? Well, the answer to that is yes. Then, you know, why would you not perceive the things that I say uh to be right. Why do I always seem to have this feeling within me like I have to justify myself and the words that I speak? I shouldn't have to. And I shouldn't have to literally sit here and, and, and kind of, uh, in a sense, force or push you into your Bibles. If you have no desire to get in your Bibles, you got more problems than whether what I'm telling you is right or wrong. You know, it is what it is. It ain't what it ain't. It is what it is. It says what it says, and it means what it means. And, you know, I am what I am by the grace of God. I'm going to do me. You do you. I'm going to let the Lord lead me and teach me and guide me. I'm not going to lean on my own, own understanding. I'm going to on, lean on the understanding of God. You can lean on your own understanding. You can lean on the understanding uh or the so-called preconceived wisdom of man, of a pastor, of others, all you want to. But uh, I'm placing all my bets on God here. And everything I tell you is going to come straight from the Bible. So you have a choice. You know, you have to decide for yourself, you know, how you perceive me. Um, if you think I'm telling the truth, if you think I'm a godly man, if you think I love the Lord, um, then, you know, Give what weight to it that you will. Um, believe what you want, think what you want, do what you want, live how you want. Uh, but I'm going to live for God. And I'm not going to gonna come up with any more uh, excuses or uh, ways in an attempt to justify myself or the words that I have spoken because I don't, I don't need to be justified. God and his word that I speak and read to you justifies so God's got my back. Girls, you know, your mom, I hate that she thinks and feels the way she does about me. She really has no purpose, no reason for it. Um, Joshua said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. But it's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. I'm believing in the Lord. I, I, I have completely sold my life out to the Lord. And she didn't like it. And so now she's taking you away from me. And I'm telling you, I'm leaving you these videos because if for whatever reasons, you know, it's not the will of God, 
and he doesn't bring you back to me and, and we live together as a family here on this earth, when I die, I pray that one day you'll see these videos and you'll watch them and you'll gain this wisdom and knowledge that I have shared and that one day you'll be in heaven with me along with your mother. But, you know, your mother, the Lord is going to have to get a hold of her in a serious, serious kind of way. But I want all of us, you, your sister, I want your mom, I want all of us to be in heaven and, and, and a, in a sense, uh, to a certain degree, um, kind of kind of be the family in heaven that we never were here on earth. You know, it hurts me to be away from you. It hurts me to, to, to wonder and to think all the time, you know, are you happy? Are you sad? Are you crying? Do you have plenty of clothes? Do you have plenty of food? Do you have a roof over your head? Just constantly, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, worrying about you. She done turned her phone off or got a new phone number. Um, I have no way to get in contact with you. I don't know where you live. She's just completely shut me out. Girls, I love you. And folks, I love you too. I don't want to die and go to hell. I don't want my daughter and my grandbabies to die and go to hell. And I don't want none of you to die and go to hell. And I am sharing this with you out of love. Not out of the love that I possess in the flesh, but out of the love that God has for me. Because God first loved me, I love all of you. And I want all of us not to perish and go to hell. I want us to all to be raised up and go to heaven. And I'm trying to teach you the best way I know how, but, you know, uh, do with what you will. I've shown you, this is not the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. It is the Lord's model prayer. The Lord's model prayer and the Lord's prayer, two totally different things. Uh, the Lord's prayer is the prayer that the Lord actually prayed out of his mouth. The Lord's model prayer, which is in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13, that is what he uses to teach us and to show us how to construct our prayers and how they should be formed and presented unto, unto God the Father, just like he did with his actual prayer in John chapter 17. Look at it, think of it, however well you want to. Hey, Matthew chapter 6, you know, those are good words. I mean, I'm not saying don't pray that prayer. Uh, I've prayed that prayer many times. Um, it's a great, it, it, it is a great prayer. It was a very good example uh, for the Lord to share with them and, and through his word now, share with us. Hey, by no means am I telling you not to pray that prayer. But I'm just saying that whenever you look at it, you think of it, you refer to it, you know, you're, you're not really doing the Lord a service by saying it's the Lord's prayer. It's the Lord's model prayer. It's his teaching tool, his instrument that he used to teach them and he's using to teach us how to construct and conform our prayers to give them unto God the Father. The Lord's prayer is a prayer that he prayed because his time was short. He was about to be arrested. And what little bit of uh, quote-unquote freedom he had left he took and used that time and used that freedom to pray for the disciples and to pray for you and to pray for me. I'm telling you something, folks. I mean, that's a prayer there. When, when, when you put others first, at the time in which he prayed this, oh my goodness, you know, he could have prayed unto the Father for himself, for other things, for sin to leave this world, you know, whatever. But he was like, you know what? I pray that you not take them out of the world, but you keep sin and evil uh, away from them for them not to be tempted. He's praying for us. That's love, folks. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stay with, with the word of God. Um, I'll give a, a, a pastor of church that's Jews when I hear a good sermon, but uh, I'm strictly sticking with God here. Uh, wisdom of man does nothing for me. But y'all have a wonderful week. Uh, I hope it's a blessed week, a happy week. And until next time, you two, may God be with you. Girls, I love you. Uh, I, I, I pray that God just surrounds you with love, a hedge of protection. He just holds you in his arms and keeps you safe. And I pray that he brings you back to me. I love you and I miss you.
Till next time, girls. Bye-bye.